As a person with facial blindness, I'm definitely no expert in telling different faces in people. For example, it wasn't until the year 2020, five years after the movie Martian came out, that I realized it was Matt Damon who was the person that was left on Mars alone, instead of Mark Wahlberg or even Erling Haaland who is in the Premier League playing soccer right now. Even with such abilities, I was still able to wake up at 2am in the morning to call my friend and tell him that Grand Moff Tarkin in the Rogue One movie, the new one that Disney made, is no longer the same Peter Cushing that we saw in the original 1977, A New Hope. There was obviously something off with Moff Tarkin in this case, but we don't know what it is. It is a different sense of creepiness or horror that we would see in most classical horror films such as Alien, but something just feels so off and we don't know what it is in an unsettling way. While Peter Cushing has been a legendary character who played numerous antagonists, his intimidating appearance and acting are so far from being defined as creepy. Star Wars has proven to us how weird aliens could look like, with the iconic ones being Jabba in Episode 6, Wampa on Hoth, Kaminoans from Attack of the Clones, and the list would go on forever. I know at this point in time, some of you might be pausing this video and yelling at me saying, Hey Richard, these are not even human, they are just alien characters created to serve as horrible nightmares for kids back in the 1980s. And I'm gonna say you're probably right, they're indeed alien characters, and they're nowhere near humans, um, whether regarding their characteristics or morphologies. Yet, both Moth Tarkings we see earlier are based on the same human character at least, they're both different versions of Peter Cushing in a sense, yet it still presents this oddity to us that we cannot explain this very unsettling feeling. So what is happening here? Before talking more about that, let's take this one step further by looking at Grogu from Mandalverse, we all love him. He is a little tiny green creature with big ears and no pupils. But we still find him lovely, we make stickers for him, we make plushies for our children, and we even like run him down the Macy's Parade with Funko as the main company as a big balloon. Apparently something counterintuitive is happening here. How come that a green little creature that is not human is more cute in a sense that um, it outcompetes a replica of a human character that everyone loves? More importantly, does realism still correlate with likeness at all? We're here today to take you on a cruise through the neuroscience of creepiness right after the hyperspace jump. drawn by Chris Van Allsburg back in 1985, though I believe that a lot of us are more familiar with the 2004 remade animated version, which is pretty cool. Despite being a nostalgic film, the new animated version was released with a bunch of negative reviews, with viewers saying that it does not resemble the warmth of human face as well. The Times highlighted the film was original decried for its dead-eyed zombie-like animation. Sorry Robert, we know you tried. Even in the next 20 years with technological progress, similar examples kept popping up into views such as the stiff facial animations featured in the game Mass Effect Andromeda in 2017, not mentioning the earlier versions of Cyberpunk 2077 in which you may find the eyes and teeth of the characters floating in the air. The list goes on and on, from media to artwork such as Beyonce wax figure at the Madame to Salt. We can even take a look into the toy industry, as the following pictures demonstrate the comparison of classic and modern versions of figures. I think we've raised enough examples here to get our minds a bit tangled, but how comes that our likeness decreases toward a more lifelike character compared to a completely fictional figure? And more importantly, what are some patterns and relationships we can find between human resemblance and our likeness? 
Well, let's visualize the problem here. Imagine creating Descartes coordinate system in which the x-axis marks the level of resemblance a figure has compared to human, and the y-axis being affinity, how much we like it compared to a human. Then we drop in the data set. Let's start with an easy one. This is our friend, Alex. Where do you think he fits on the graph? Hope you got this one right. He goes on the top right corner for his 100% human, hopefully. And for most of the time, we have 100% affinity for him. Next, we have Grogu. Here's Grogu on the graph. As the graph suggests, Grogu has around 50% resemblance and 50% affinity. To the left of Grogu, we can plot minions and most fictional characters that aren't aimed to recreate the figure or a real human. If we pause here, it would seem obvious that the plot shows a linear trend coinciding with the majority of our common sense. However, things easily take a turn if we add in on our first example, the 2016 mob target. Let's consider the resemblance of CGI as 80%, yet where would it fall on the y-axis? You're right, below zero. Since we're using affinity as the measurement here, any kind of creepiness or horror would be negative. Furthermore, we can find the lowest point by using zombies. Ooh, I'm scared. As an example here, they're directly derived from humans, but look way more terrifying than CGI characters and fictional creatures. Let's add in some final touches, connect all the data points, and smoothen the curve. There we have it, an oddly shaped, counterintuitive plot showing a sudden dip in affinity once a character closely resembles a human. This unsettling dip in affinity isn't something we just noticed recently with CJ characters. In fact, this is exactly what Masahiro Mori described uh, first in 1970 in Japan. Mori was a roboticist, not a CJ artist, and his time, there's no hyper-realistic digital effects, no AI-generated faces, and certainly no motion capture. So how he did, did he discover this uncanny valley? Well, let's set the scene. This was Japan in the 1970s, an era when television and visual media were booming. The first wave of humanoid robots was appearing, not in real life, but in pop culture. Sci-fi shows, anime, and movies were shaping people's expectations of artificial humans. Meanwhile, early robotics research was advancing, with industrial robots beginning to enter factories. Mori noticed something very curious. When robots looked clearly artificial, like they had mechanical arms in factories, people had no problem with them. And when they looked exactly like humans, like realistic prosthetic hands, they were also accepted. But when a robot was almost human, like a mannequin with just too much detail, it triggered unease. So, he plotted a graph. As human resemblance increases, our affinity rises until it suddenly drops. This dip became known as Bukimi no Tani in Japanese, or the Uncanny Valley. At the time, CGI was still in its infancy, so Mori's research wasn't about movies or video games. It was about robotics and prosthetics. But fast forward 50 years, and his hypothesis is everywhere from CGI faces to wax figures, AI-generated images, and even certain toy designs. So something must be going on in that valley that makes certain figures so unnerving. If we want to understand why, we need to isolate the individual factors that contribute to this effect. The history of science has taught us a valuable lesson that whenever you're stuck with a complex problem, go backwards and return to where everything started. When we plot this graph, we begin with reference points. Now let's start by breaking down what we mean by human resemblance, because it's a little arbitrary. Is it just about the shape, or the texture, the color, the way something moves? Turns out, it's all of the above. So let's look at some cases where a change in just one of these factors can push something into this uncanny valley. Mario was always a pixelated 2D figure, so when he first jumped into 3D, some people found it weird. Lego minifig with a smooth cartoonish face looks fine, but hyper-realistic ones with too much detail feel a little off. And a minion is cute because it's bright yellow and stylized, but what happens if we make it a skin tone version? Yeah, it's nightmare fuel. So each of these cases hint at something deeper. Our brains expect a certain level of consistency. When an object strays too far from its expected category, 
we get a sense of unease. Think about dolls. Kids love them, but as adults, we find them creepy. Why? Because they look almost human, but not quite. Their smooth plastic faces are fine in a toy context, but when scaled up to life-size mannequins, that same smoothness becomes a bit unsettling. Now that you know how it works, you should be capable of incorporating the idea of the uncanny valley into your everyday life, even just for fun. For example, when brainstorming about Halloween costumes, maybe follow the idea of replacing iconic features of your character in an unsettling way. A doll-like makeup or a faceless mask would do the work in front of your friends. On the other hand, if you're thinking about starting an animated project, designing a mascot or making a 3D game, you might consider avoiding the danger zone. Try increasing the deviation toward the left half of the graph and create a friendly character with exaggerated proportions. Another option is to completely mask some features. Even as a villain, Darth Vader mask completely removes the risk of uncanny facial expressions to reduce the psychological discomfort of viewers. At the end of the day, the uncanny valley isn't just a fun graph. It's a fundamental part of how our brains handle deviation, perception, and expectation. Think about it when we say something feels off, what does that actually mean? We're describing a mismatch between stimulus and perception, what we expect to see versus what we actually see. And that's not just relevant to creepy CGI or robotics, it's a core part of neuroscience, psychology, and even artificial intelligence. For example, in developmental neuroscience, scientists would ask how babies learn to recognize faces. Research suggests that infants prefer high contrast, symmetrical, and slightly exaggerated features. Think about how baby toys, cartoons, or even our own facial expressions when talking to kids tend to be overly animated. Their brains are wired to see patterns that align with early cognitive processing. If a face looks too complex or just slightly wrong, it doesn't fit their developing neural models which would explain why young children often find certain dolls or animatronics unsettling. And beyond neuroscience, these ideas are deeply relevant in AI and design. In human-computer interaction, researchers study how to create realistic digital avatars without triggering the uncanny valley. In medicine, doctors use facial reconstruction and prosthetics that balance realism with psychological comfort. Even in marketing, Companies tweak character design ads to ensure audiences find them engaging rather than creepy. So, while today we talked about uncanny CGI and creepy robots, what we're really exploring is how we perceive the world around us. The uncanny valley is just one case where expectation meets deviation, but the same principles apply everywhere, including my voice right now. And it would certainly take you a minute or two to spot these quirky deviation and differences, like the trick we just did right now. Sum them up and then explore the fundamental logic behind them, just like we did today. In other words, as long as you are a great observer of life, you already own a creative and talented mind of science. Before we wrap up, here's a final brain teaser. If the uncanny valley is all about the brain struggling with realism, could we ever train ourselves out of it? Could exposure to ultra-realistic AI and CGI eventually make the valley disappear? Or is this reaction something that is too deeply wired to human perception to ever change? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you want to learn more about the sciences behind the Uncanny Valley hypothesis, please read this amazing journal article written by one of our undergrad authors. We've attached the link in the description also. If you hope to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to our channel. It really means a lot to us. A television and visual media will be <laughs> Imagine creating. <laughs> Do you help? Thanks for asking. <laughs> this is our friend, Alex. Where do you think he puts on the craft?